Fabulous. Uh, well, it's a, a great honor to introduce today uh, and have everybody here, just absolutely fabulous. So as uh, I would like to thank Lacey and good afternoon to everyone. Um, this is, by the way, the 40th year of the Women and Business Conference here in Utah. We'd like to dedicate this luncheon to all of the past Athena recipients, many of whom are here today. Well, the past Athena recipients, please stand. In attendance today are Pamela Atkinson, Karen Gunn, Patricia Jones, Peggy Larson, who's also today's vice chair, Linda Leckman, Becky Potts, Rhoda Ramsey, Chris Redgrave, Patricia Richards, Ramona Rudert, and Marilyn Tang. We'd like to thank also our major sponsors today who've helped to make this conference possible. The conference sponsor, American Express. Today's luncheon sponsor, Wells Fargo. The media sponsor, my fine friends and colleagues here from iHeartMedia, KNRS 105.9 Talk Radio. The luncheon keynote sponsor, Select Health. Our other sponsors are Arik Solar, Chase, Fidelity Investments, Questar, and Workers' Compensation Fund. Our supporting sponsors today, America First Credit Union, Ancestry, Avalanche Studios, CBRE, CenturyLink, Enterprise Newspaper Group, the Larry H. Miller Group of Companies, O.C. Tanner, Rio Tinto Kennecott, and Utah Media Group. We'd also want to give a very special thanks to all of our table sponsors today, exhibitors, and of course, Little America for hosting us. For a full list of sponsors, please note the table tent cards and program. It's now my privilege to introduce today's sponsor for our keynote speaker, Tara Page. Tara, please join us on stage. Thank you, Abby. It is my pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, Kristen Armstrong. This past August, during the Rio Summer Olympic Games, history was made in women's cycling. For the third time, Olympian Kristen Armstrong won the gold medal for USA and celebrated her 43rd birthday later that same week. Sorry for revealing your age, it wasn't my idea. <laughs> Kristen had won the gold in the Beijing and London Olympic Games as well. She accomplished this after an active career as a junior Olympian in swimming and as a triathlete. She turned to cycling as therapy for her osteoarthritis diagnosis. The Boise, Idaho native has also won three world titles and five national championships. Please welcome me and join Please join me in welcoming the most decorated female cyclist in U.S. history, Kristen Armstrong. Thank you so much. And um, gosh, I can't believe you revealed my age. <sighs> now I can't be 29 for the rest of my life. <laughs> oh, well. Um, so. Gosh, you know, I was lucky to make it this, this afternoon to be here. I was coming on a flight from Boise, Idaho, and um, engine problems, and I'm like, oh, here we go, here we go. But it was, it was meant to be, because here I am. I landed about a quarter to 12, and I'm here, and um, so inspired to speak to all of you. Um, I want to thank Select Health for um, sponsoring the keynote speaker. Um, we're, we've been partners, and I just appreciate their, their support. Um, also, the Salt Lake Chamber. Um, you know, this is such a wonderful event, and 
I, um, the first thing I said to um, Greg from Select Health coming over here was like, does Boise have anything like this? And he's like, I don't think so. And I'm like, well, let's make it happen. So, um, you know, here I am, I'm trying to come and I've been asked to inspire all of you, but already after reading all about the Athena Awards and the Pathfinder Award, I am actually inspired by all of you and I can already feel the energy even within the first 15 minutes that I walked in this room, I met so many amazing people. And so I can already feel the energy here. So I want to do my best, but I know that each and every day I love to be inspired. So I hope that I can leave you with some inspiration as well. So I'm sure all of you, not maybe all of you, because maybe some of you ride bikes, but what does a girl in spandex have to do with all of you? And what in the world can I say to you to inspire you? Because I'm sure you get motivational speakers all the time in your businesses and organizations. But really, we do have a lot in common. Um, I'm a mom. Some of you are moms. Um, I actually started a business. And uh, we recently sold it last spring. I, prior to the Rio games, um, between London and Rio, I work full time at um, our health system in Boise, Idaho at St. Luke's as the director of community health. So I am in the, the corporate world. And um, gosh, you know, I think that the number one thing that we have in common is that we are all committed to excellence. And I think of the word commitment as the key to achieving excellence. So committed to excellence, commitment. Um, personally, I don't believe that anyone can dream of excellence without total commitment. So I'm going to ask each of you just to answer this question to yourself. What does commitment to excellence mean to all of you? Because to me, excellence is actually a state of mind. It's an attitude. So I want to start off today, and I want to share my story. I have four journeys, which brought me four lessons, which I believe helped me get to the pinnacle of sport. So that top step of sport. So the top step in anything. So I want you to, to listen to my stories through my journeys, and hopefully you can take away some things that are going to help you down your road to excellence and success. So it took me 12 years in the sport of cycling, competing at the highest level, to even remotely begin to think that I can be consistent in anything. I mean, every four years, I have one day to try to win, to try to be my best. And that consistency, it happened. The stars had to be aligned, though. I thought I had everything in place but there still had to be that perfect alignment of the stars. Things had to be just right. I mean, there were plenty of peaks and there were plenty of valleys, but gosh, there was also plenty of plateaus. So to think that you were gonna show up one day and, and try to make it for a third time on top, you just never know. One of my favorite quotes is um, actually by author Malcolm Gladwell and it says, it takes roughly 10,000 hours of practice to achieve mastery in a field. I've heard that plenty of times, and you know, I started to believe it, and I would say that mastery is a very strong word, um, but I would say it took me about 10,000 hours to even begin to get out of my own way <laughs> and to think that I knew just a little bit about um, showing up and, and doing well on that one day. So here we go, we're gonna start with Athens. Athens back in 2004, that was my first Olympic Games. And so my first Olympic Games before I left, I had a really good friend and he said to me, hey Kristen, congratulations for making the team, do me a favor, do not forget to compete. And I'm like, what is this guy talking about? Like I'm a competitor, I don't, I don't. Someone's like, don't forget to do your work when you go, go to the office, I'm like, all right. So I'm like, I get it Greg, I get it. Um, don't forget to compete, thanks for the advice. So I go to Athens and I go to the opening ceremonies and 36 hours later I race and about eight hours later I'm out at the Plyka with my family having Greek food and um, I'm enjoying every moment of Athens. I'm enjoying every moment of like dressing up in my Olympic opening ceremonies outfit and wondering what it would be like 
oh, I'm just going to put on the closing ceremony one too and take selfies and, and pictures. But I raced, and all of a sudden I finished, and I was like, oh, yeah, that piece of advice. I didn't compete. I didn't think of it as any different than every other day. So here's the deal. I went into Athens, and I had this goal. I had a goal of making the Olympic team, and that was in June, so I made it. So, right. That's my point, is I had a goal. Goals stop. You accomplish them, and they stop. How do you get past a goal? And so, what I learned, and what my takeaway from Athens was, is that you have to have a vision to be really, really successful. Truly successful, it takes a vision. And a vision is something that's very different than a goal. It's very different than an idea. In fact, if I receive one more idea in my life, I, don't, I might run as far as I can. <laughs> there's lots of ideas, there's lots of goals, and those are very important to get to accomplish your vision. But there are people out there that actually have never experienced a vision. And a vision is something that you can paint in your, pit, in your mind so clearly to what you want that the steps, you may not know exactly how you're going to get there every step, but as long as you stay on that track, you can then get clarity, and you can make a plan, and you can act. So from Athens, that's what I took away. And so here I am. I'm committed. Four more years. All right. I want to give this another try. So four years. Four years later, here we are. We're heading into Beijing. And um, this time around, wow, I did things a little bit differently. I had a very clear vision of what I wanted, and that was I wanted to be, I wanted to compete like my friend said I, well, he reminded me to compete and I didn't. And so I had a very clear plan. I wanted to be on the podium. I wanted to win a gold medal in Beijing. And so what did that take? Well, I actually learned a lesson before I got to Beijing. And I started assembling what I consider my team. And my team consisted of USA Cycling. It consisted of my husband, who pretty much every day is considered my psychologist. And um, it, it, it took my, my coach. Most people have coaches when you're an athlete, but they don't really have a team because maybe that coach is threatened by more people than him or her. And so I had a team of people. I had um, a dietitian that worked with me. I had somebody who actually just looked at my equipment. And so... Um, this team was very, very critical because what I did was six months before the games, I actually flew to Beijing to look at the course because if I didn't see the course, I wouldn't know what kind of equipment I had to bring up that hill. The time trial happened to be a mountain climb. And so we had to lighten my bike up. And because of that, we were able to have the edge on all my other competitors. But without the team really breaking this down for me, I might have not have been where I ended up, which was on that top step. You know, um, I feel like when you have that team, so when I went into, one example is I actually rode a bike that typically the weight limit is 15 pounds. Most time trial bikes are around 17 to 18 pounds. My bike was the lightest bike there. It was um, 15 pounds at the start line. In fact, one of the most famous time trials in men's cyclists was picking up my bike in awe. And so here we are, we're leading the, the way of technology. In Beijing, it was also how I started my company. And that was because um, if you've ever ridden a bike, I'm sure we've all dropped our chain. And so my husband, he just had this fear of me dropping my chain on this course because we were screaming down at like um, about 50 miles an hour to the final corner on this course to about a 500 meter uphill. And you had to go from your big chain ring to your small chain ring. And so he was like, oh, I know you. You're going to drop that chain. I know it. And I'm like, why would you say that? Why would you, why would you say that I would drop my chain out of all people? He goes, because that's what you do. People should hire you to test equipment because you always make it fail. I'm like, perfect. <laughs> and so um, sure enough, him and his um, brother got together, and they sketched out a, a device that, that hooks onto the front derailleur of your bike. It keeps your chain on. It doesn't matter how hard you shift. And so we um, actually went to a local manufacturing company that does um, a lot of uh, aluminum. They, they build different um, things for 
large industrial knives and they do things for um, building houses. And so we went in there and we have now what you call a K-edge, which is Kristen's edge over her competition. And so um, we actually tested the product two weeks prior to Beijing. And so all throughout my race, he was sweating bullets, thinking that that, that little device might actually um, fail because I was the tester. So really without that team, um, again, I think that the support and the teamwork is really, really critical. And so as a leader in your organization, really to begin with that why, asking you why are you doing this, sharing that with your employees, sharing that with people around you, the inspiration just heightens and so does the energy levels. You have to start with your why and put it alongside your vision. If you start with your what, everyone starts with their what. What, it's just a bike race, doesn't really matter. Your why. So here we go. Um, we're going in and uh, we're, we're, we're heading to London. And so I retired, I'm done. I actually am like, I wanna become a mom and I wanna have a family. And so I knew a few women that I raced against that were moms and I always looked at them and I was like, whatever, I can't believe they're still racing as a mom. And I'm like, that is the most selfish thing I've ever seen. And so here I am about nine months pregnant and my coach is texting me. He's like, what do you think, London? And I'm like, have you seen me lately? <laughs> I'm like, there's not a chance. <laughs> and so he's like, seriously, London? We have like 22 months. And I'm like, so we deliver a healthy child. And all of a sudden I'm like, wow, that'd be really neat to have a goal. Wow, could that, that would be really fun to have a goal. He's like, all right, November 1, it's about six weeks after delivering Lucas. We have to make a decision. So I was really excited because I'm that person, I'm that mindset, that what's next? In my vision, oh my gosh, can you imagine having your child on the podium with you at age two? This is gonna be amazing. This isn't selfish. I mean, why can't we go after our goals? And so here we go, we start, and it wasn't but like two weeks into training, I was like, what did I sign up for? I was like the nervous mom going out on the road thinking I'm gonna get hit from behind from a car. I'm looking around, I'm rushing home. I'm like, oh, okay, I got an hour in. And so that went on and went on. First time I show up to the airport, and not just me anymore, I have my pack and play, I have my Bob stroller. I'm like, oh, did you get my bike packed to my husband? Like, I need that too. And so my first race in March, just six months after having Lucas, and I'll never forget it. I thought, what am I doing? I have Lucas at the start line. I hand him to my husband. I get back from my bike race three hours later. And yes, I have to breastfeed now. <laughs> and he hands me Lucas and is like, here, now he's yours. And here, in the meantime, I have my 20-year-old teammate saying, I don't want mayonnaise on my sandwich. When's my massage? <laughs> and I'm like, this is, this is spectacular. And I'm like, I'm just worried about, I can't wait for him to take a nap, <laughs> to shower. So um, what I learned in London was that although you may be a mom or you're a dad, you may have mom guilt or dad guilt, you can still go after your dreams. You can still go after that vision. You don't have to stop what you're doing. In fact, what I've learned is that it's been a really good example that it takes really hard work to be successful. And my son's six now and he gets it. He says at basketball, so mama, if I wanna score, if I wanna shoot a basket and make it, I have to practice, don't I? Like you ride your bike? I'm like, yeah, probably. And so um, I, I, just, it w I learned that it's okay to continue to go in after your goals. And the other thing I learned was that balance. Balance is critical. In fact, at first, after London, I thought, you know what? This is my ticket, and I'm not sharing this with anybody. People may be, have really good equipment these days, and they may actually physically be really fit, but boy, all they do is ride bikes. And I'm like, I'm a mom. I'm a mom first, and I ride bikes second, and it's given me power. It's given me this ability in, to know that when I show up at home, that nothing else matters. If I had a good day or a bad day, 
my son is still smiling. He doesn't care. And it really was refreshing. So I learned balance is amazing, and you have to be healthy. You have to get sleep. You have to eat well. You have to drink well. You have to treat your body like you want it to perform. Because the minute you start trying to do more than one thing, which we do in today's society, we do several things, um, all of that stuff goes out the window. Your performance starts to decline if you don't treat your body well. And I think that treating your body well also means balance. Balance can be good. It can be your secret weapon. So here we go. Rio. That wasn't too long ago. In fact, um, how in the world did I end up after I retired the first time? I retired again after, after London. I was done, 100% done. Done, in fact. But then I realized I was so competitive that Brett Favre, he's retired a couple times. And so I'm like, well, why can't I retire a couple times and come out? I need to have some story behind me. I'm not an NFL football player, so why not? Well, after London, I was having a lot of health issues. In fact, my hips that I was introduced with, um, having pain, switching from running to cycling, well, now they've gotten really, really bad. In fact, in 2013, I had three surgeries. I actually had three surgery here at the Univers University of Utah. I actually traveled down here, because um, I hear it's like the best of the best. And so um, I came down here, had three hip procedures, and um, couldn't get on my bike for, for eight or nine months. And afterwards, after going through all the rehab, I decided I was really missing that vision and missing that goal. And so I got back on, and what I realized was that cycling was really therapeutic. And so just when I mentally started getting really discouraged and shutting things out and thinking that I don't have a chance to even exercise again, I had to change my attitude. I had to change that thought process. And I had to say, no, you know what? This is therapeutic. I can get through this. And so that's what I did. I made this little tiny goal of heading to nationals in 2015. And oh, by the way, if you win nationals, you get a spot on the world championship team. So I walk in the door one day and I said to my husband, hey, honey, um, I'm thinking, I think it'd be really cool. Like, I'm thinking that maybe I should like go to national championships in three months. And he's like, no, please, 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 please don't tell me you're going to actually do this again. I can't handle this. I can't handle this. <laughs> oh, it's just one goal. I mean, marathoners do it all the time. I, they work full time. They run on the weekends. They run before work. I can do that. Like, I can do the quality over quantity. I don't need to train that much. He's like, okay, here we go. So um, I show up to nationals, and I, I won. And my husband's like, seriously? We're going to the World Championships now? And I'm like, yeah, and you know what the good thing is? It's in Richmond, Virginia. It's actually in America. And we can do this. I mean, if I get top three in Richmond, I make the Rio team. Doesn't that sound easy? And he's like, okay, that's great. Um, here we go. So his psychology started happening, because I would come home and I'm like, I just had a horrible day. And so I got to Richmond and I was fifth. But guess what? Honey, I was top American. Isn't that cool? So top American, I have a chance for Rio because no one's an automatic. We're all in the same equal level playing field now. I can get chosen too. But what I realized at that moment is the way I thought I was going to make it to Rio, honestly, it was a shortcut. I was working full time at St. Luke's. I was training and I was a mom. And I had too much going on. And I was fifth for a reason. I was fifth for a reason. It was a message to tell me that there are no shortcuts in life. To get to the top, there are no shortcuts in life. You're going to have to do it the hard way. And I'm like, and so is my family. <laughs> and so is my team. And so we all rallied, and we got to the point where in Rio, or going towards Rio, um, it was coach's selection. And you can, I can tell you how thrilled my peers were to have me as 40 plus, to have me as taking two years off and coming back. And well, there was a few people that thought they were a shoe in They weren't very happy. And oh, did I mention today's world and social media? Yeah. Well, they like to actually say how they think out loud. 
So it was a really, really difficult time for me this past spring. In fact, Rio was the hardest, hardest challenge of all of my journeys, hardest. Because for a moment, I actually lost the focus and I lost vision. Because all I was focused on was, wow, my peers don't think I should make the team. Maybe I shouldn't make the team. Wow, I, tr I brought that stress into my races. I was third at nationals that year. And three weeks later was the coach's selection. And I thought, wow, I was third. Oh, by the way, they, these people that like to tell us how we should think, they said that third was really bad. It was actually, Kristen Armstrong got third. She has no chance. Because third, I mean, come on, third's awful, isn't it? Well, when they tell you it is, you actually start believing it when you say it over and over and over. Yeah, so I started believing it. And amazingly, it was all coaches' selection. And because of my results throughout the two years, I actually was chosen for the team in June. And within seven days, my friends arbitrated against me. And I was brought into a very... Um, much brutal situation. It was a 12-hour trial of um, USC Cycling and myself versus two other gals who wanted to be on the team. And so at that point, um, that was another distraction. I won the arbitration only to have two weeks later the girl who arbitrated against me for my spot beat me. And so this was exactly one week before I left for Rio. And I finished the race and I said to myself, game over. These girls deserve my spot. I can't do this anymore. I'm done. <clears throat> so I had, luckily, here I come, my team, I had somebody hand me the phone and say, you need to talk to somebody outside your team because your team is all supportive of you. You need to talk to someone that, that is just gonna tell you straight is gonna ask you a few questions. And so I picked up the phone and he said, hey, it's Dean. I said, oh, hey, Dean, what's up? He's like, you had a bad race, didn't you? And I'm like, oh, it was worse than bad. It was horrible. He's like, what's wrong with you? And I just started rambling. I'm like, it's not physical, it's not physical. I know it's not. He's like, well, that's a good thing. He goes, because we can't do much in two weeks physically. And he goes, is it just stress? And I said, it's stress. It's so much stress, I don't even know what to do. I can't even sleep at night. He goes, well, stress is real. He's like, don't underestimate the power of stress. He's like, we gotta take this next seven days and get you back into thinking mentally positive and get you back focusing on the vision of a third gold medal and making history. And it was because of that one phone call that turned me around. One phone call turned me around. So here's the moral of my, my story and my journeys. Four journeys later, it comes back to your why and your vision. Why are you doing what you're doing? And what's your vision? That's really, truly what brought me to my third gold medal. So you start with your why. You couple it with your vision. You can't do it without your team. Balance and believing in yourself, that mental confidence. Having a vision is so important in life, I can't underestimate how powerful it is. And in today's world, we are filled with so many ideas. We can't, we can't confuse these words of dreams and ideas and visions. They're different. A vision inspires action. And a powerful vision inspires people like all of you to come together. It brings together resources. It creates energy and will to make change happen. It inspires individuals and organizations to commit and to give their best. When you have a vision, you know where you wanna go. In fact, you can see it. But you may not be able to see the entire path. One of my favorite quotes is, you don't have to see the whole staircase, you just have to take the first step. That's by Martin Luther King. So I hope today I was able to share with you some of the lessons I learned, and hopefully you can take some of those with you on your path to success. 
in your path down the road of excellence. And I also want to congratulate all the past recipients, all the recipients that will be recognized today, and to all of you who are extraordinary leaders in the city of Utah. Um, I'm empowered. Thank you. Pretty remarkable, absolutely astonishing, Kristin, and uh, some advice. You should have cycled here today. You'd have got for here faster. <laughs> okay, well, let's move onwards and upwards here. We certainly appreciate your commitment to this conference and the success of women in the state of Utah. As Lacey mentioned, proceeds from today's luncheon, as well as donations made by those attending the conference, benefit the Salt Lake Chamber Women's Business Center. November 24th will mark the 19th anniversary of the opening of the Women's Business Center. For nearly two decades, the Women's Business Center has provided counseling, training, and encouragement to thousands of women and men. Since we last met a year ago, the Women's Business Center has assisted 230 clients. They have also provided over 560 hours of counseling, training nearly 2,000 500 people. This effort has contributed to more than 73 new business plans and most importantly 91 new businesses started and 278 new jobs created. The businesses that the Women's Business Center has assisted with have created more than $20.5 million in total revenue, assessed $2.1 million in capital and increased their profit by $2.9 million. <laughs> Truly, the Women's Business Center helps dreamers become entrepreneurs. And those entrepreneurs make Utah's economy one of the strongest in the nation. We would like to recognize our great team at the Women's Business Center. Anne-Marie Wallace serves as executive director. Deb Bilbao is the business consultant. Deborah Marzano and Valerie Johnson work on in-person and online training. Melissa Richardson and Tori Cruikshank serve as rural and minority outreach vistas. Thank you for all that you do as a team. We'd also like to thank the chamber staff who host these types of events for the Women's Business Center. A special thanks to Jackie Sexton, Lisa Ostrander, Tari McHugh, and the chamber's marketing team, Matt Lusty, Marissa Bomis, and Bianca Yardley. This has been a really, really busy year for the chamber, and we certainly appreciate everything that you do for us. The chamber is led by an amazing board of governors, including this year's board chair, Keith McMullen, who's here with us today at the head table. I'd also like to recognize the work of the Women and Business Conference Committee. Those of you that worked on this committee, would you please take a moment to stand for us? Finally, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for your support. You truly do make a difference. I'm honored to be in a room full of such incredibly talented people and leaders.